Hello, and welcome to ASMR Tirar the Huello. Are you hoping to calm your mind, relax your body, or experience ASMR? Dr. Andrew Michaels is here to help you. Today, Dr. Andrew Michaels has some strong feelings about the best course of action to take to keep the people of the world safe and shares a highly classified story from his past as evidence. Will the doctor be successful? General, good evening. It's so good to finally meet you. Yes, I have secured our package the aliens, the debris, the surviving ship. Everything is loaded up on a train and on its way to Dayton, Ohio. How was your trip into Roswell, New Mexico, this evening? I understand. Well, if I can make it any better, we have some food and some refreshments here. As per your aides suggestions, I don't like, uh, yeah, I'm not much into the, the whole, uh, fast food scene myself. <laughs> I know. Well, we'll get right down to it then if you're all right. All right. Coffee for the general, please. Two creams. Thank you. Well, what we have here is a secure package, um, as I'm sure President Truman and the Joint Chiefs of Staff have briefed you. Everything has been secured except for one small issue. The intelligence officer at the base told the press. Somehow it got out to the Roswell newspaper. It's a small newspaper, but... Regardless, the story could get picked up on a wire and go nationwide. I highly suggest we go down there and stop that press tonight. We can't let that newspaper go out. I understand. Um, it's one thing to suppress something before the press finds out, but it's another thing when the press finds out. I understand the rules. I understand the freedom of the press. I understand a lot of things, but I also understand national security, sir. I don't suggest we go down there and break their printing presses or their legs. But we've got to stop that newspaper from going out. We only have a matter of hours. I understand your position. I'm a little bit pressed back to understand why you're so resistant. Yes, it is world-changing, but... I don't think we're ready for it. I thought that was the general consensus in Washington, sir. Oh, I see. Well, there's other ways to make your name. In your history. I understand who's in charge. I understand the chain of command, sir. I am also understand that I was told to press you on this matter. I think I'm going the wrong direction with you. Would it be alright if I told you a story to try to get you to understand why I feel this way? If you will allow me over a cup of coffee, I'll tell you a story of when this happened another time. Okay. I won't take too much of your time. It all started in 1932. FDR had just taken the presidency from Hoover. Now in 1932, I know it's not like it is now in 1947. The world's totally changed. The atomic bomb, aliens visiting the planet, we won the war. All those things are good things, but 
1932, things were very bleak. And we were trying to get help wherever we could find it. There was a group of scientists who had discovered a, I don't know, hidden alcove of human beings that had segregated themselves off from the rest of civilization in West Virginia. And I was sent there to observe what was going on there. I took a small team with me. As I said, FDR was looking for men with bright ideas, new ideas, and it was possible this was a group of communists. And they didn't want anything to upset the apple cart, as they say. We surveilled these people and their small hidden alcove for several weeks. Our listening devices weren't working. Our telephoto lenses on our cameras weren't catching what we wanted. We knew very little about them. They walked kind of oddly. They were thin. They didn't, they looked almost emaciated. They didn't look like regular West Virginians, if you will. Country folk are pretty hardy and pretty strong. These people didn't quite look that way. They looked like emaciated Appalachians that, you know, maybe didn't have a lot of money or jobs or food. And that struck me odd. Their appearance was even disheveled and they drove old vehicles, even though they lived in a very, very modern looking compound not even avant-garde even beyond that the design was beautiful but sedate it was an austere setting for them I was confused by the whole setup driving an old clunky model T Ford truck into town with your wife obviously pregnant and with child still getting a few groceries, visiting the telegraph, seeing a movie, buying a newspaper, just, they seemed normal, but they seemed odd. One day, they caught a glimpse of us using a camera to try to take their photograph. And unfortunately, our cover blown, they tried to make a quick getaway in a very old and rickety truck. The truck careened off the road and wrecked. They weren't harmed very badly, but the wife obviously had broken her leg. So we called for an ambulance, and when the ambulance was retrieved, we took her to a local hospital. The wreck, it had seemed, had started her labor. Her husband was vehemently opposed, vehemently opposed to us taking her to our hospital, saying that uh, through religious reasons and otherwise, cultural reasons, he was denying them touching her, examining her, etc. Well, that was his choice and she agreed, but the baby saw it otherwise. And she went into a hard labor in the emergency room. Now, this was a small country hospital with literally two rooms for an emergency room, one doctor on staff, and two nurses. The ambulance drivers dropped them off. They left. So you're talking around five or six people. My two agents, two nurses, a doctor, and a couple. So maybe seven or eight of us. I don't know. My math is fuzzy even now. The doctor immediately knew something was wrong. Her physiology was not right. Her legs, appearing to bend one way, actually bent another. Her leg wasn't broken at all. She had merely sprained her ankle, or whatever you call an ankle. They had legs like, almost like, kangaroos, not quite jumping legs, but walked backwards. She 
was giving birth to premature babies. And the father told us to stand back and let nature take its course. Her labor wasn't that aggressive and the babies started to come out one after the other. Three tiny fetal babies with hardly any arms, no discernible fingers, their body trailing behind with legs that were utter stubs, and the babies crawled from her uterus out into the atmosphere, as cleanly as I can tell this story, across her belly and into a, as insane as it sounds, a marsupial pouch. She had her chest covered up, but it was very, very much aware and made clear to us that she did not have mammary glands on her chest, and neither did her husband. Their mammary glands were only on the female and in the pouch. I was looking directly at a marsupial human. It didn't bother her to be uncovered in the chest region because there was nothing to show or be ashamed of or be vain or embarrassed about. But she did want to cover up her pouch area once the babies had started suckling. And I was quite all right with that. The nurses cleaned her up and covered her up. And the whole scene was beyond disturbing for all of us concerned. Some of the men had never even seen a human birth, let alone something like this. I had to ask. The husband turned to me and said, Before you even think about restraining me, before you even think about walking out of this room, any of you, you're going to listen to me first. Now that you know, I'm going to tell you a story. He told me originally his people, his tribe, had lived in the island continent of Australia. And everything that we saw was true. They were marsupial humanoids. I said, you don't sound like you're from Australia. And you don't look Australian. You don't look Aborigine either. He said, my race predates both the white race that came in the 19th century and the Aborigines who originally founded Australia 50,000 years ago. And I said, 50,000 years ago. He said, yes. And that's where my story goes. My ancestors 50,000 years ago watched the Aborigines landing on the island. When they came across the marsupial lion, a huge predatory creature, and they saw the giant lizards and crocodiles on the beaches in the inlets, they knew they couldn't cope with these creatures coming at them from the brush from the deep, dense jungle of Australia. So they started to terraform the island, starting fires, burning off the land to give themselves space so they could see predators coming at them, so they could discover the marsupial lion's dens, so they could see the giant lizard's nests of eggs. And they could push back the crocodile now because they didn't have to live on the beaches where they were safe. One day, a female of our tribe was gathering berries and was stumbled upon by a small group of Aborigine men and women. The shock of seeing them stunned both sides. But soon the Aborigines realized they weren't alone on the island. 
She, of course, escaped unharmed and went back to her tribe. If you thought they were clear-cutting for the predators, you should have seen what they did when they realized there was other humans on the island. They formed war parties and torching everywhere, burning, 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 searching, looking for these gods, these angels, these other people. And they couldn't find them, so they kept the destruction up until it got out of hand. And they literally burned half of the territory they were in down. The council held a meeting and anger was upon us. These primates, these barely evolved humans destroying our homeland. Our wise men were asked what to do. We had lived here for generations, for thousands, thousands of years, even before we started recording our own history, and we had no concept of what to do in this situation. Others had visited the island and just left over the years. These people clearly came here with the intent of colonizing it. The wise men said, we have choices to make. We can go down there and we can destroy those that found us, that know of us. They're a small group, only a few hundred. We can wipe them out and then we can hide our identity. We realized then that we couldn't live openly here anymore and we had to leave our island paradise, our Garden of Eden. He said the alternative then is to leave. The problem is they know of us. They'll keep looking. They're not going to stop. We're the competition. They're going to see evidence of us. They're going to know we're here. Even in their sleep, they'll be looking for us. So if we leave, they'll destroy this island and everything on it to find us. It changes their history. It changes the trajectory of their development. Look what damage has already been done. So a compromise was struck and a group of warriors went to the beach areas where that tribe lived and they killed every single one of that tribe. The men, the women, and the children. You know what that's like. Old school, Old Testament Bible thumping, killing them all, and letting God sort them out. And when we realized our sin, regardless of what we thought were our good intentions, we could no longer bear living in our island paradise, and our wise men were correct in the compromise struck. We protected our homeland to a degree, but we lost it at the same time. Poisoned by our own sin, we gathered up all evidence of ourselves, destroyed all remnants of our civilization there, and we left. We left. Over the years, we'd hoped man would change. We had hoped that men like us would see the folly of their sins, the folly of murder, the folly of destroying things, wiping out nature, destroying their very land they live on, poisoning the land. Every so many thousand years we would come back to our homeland and visit, and it rarely changed. It still was the same. But these new men, these new men that came in the 
early part of the 19th century, your time. Over 50,000 years had passed and nothing changed, except one thing. Ah, one thing did change. Your modern civilization was industrializing, and you were learning how to murder on an industrial scale. Wars after war after war. And now the Great War in 1914 to 1918. A war so bad, so horrible. You brought death to an entire continent, and still you don't change your ways. You see, we're here to gather an archive information because we've passed judgment again. We think 50,000 years is long enough to wait to go back to paradise. What you've stumbled upon is an alcove of like gathering information like a library through our modern technology that we have. And once we do, they're going to wipe this planet clean of your species. Because you haven't changed. And we've waited long enough. Now, General, everybody in that room was gripped with terror as four more people just like the couple we had captured, appeared out of nowhere. The amazing thing was none of them brandished weapons. They didn't need to. They could come and go as they pleased. We stood there in abject terror. They stared at us. They weren't happy. They weren't smug. They weren't superior feeling. You could tell they were in great distress. They did not want to do what they were going to do, but they were going to carry out their terms. They had waited long enough for us to grow and change and evolve, and they had seen enough. And I spoke up. And I said, we didn't hurt you when we realized who you were. We brought you to a hospital. We offered your wife safety. We offered her medicine. We offered her help. You've never been restrained this whole time. And to be quite honest, regardless of what you think, you've committed no crime. The traffic accident was a miscommunication. Yes, we were spying on you, but we were spying from a safe, discreet distance. We weren't trying to harm you. Our country's in an upheaval, a Great Depression, in 1932. And... There are so many enemies outside and within. We had to ascertain who you were, friend or foe. You wouldn't be here unless we were at least somewhat a beacon of hope to your people. Why would you be in West Virginia gathering evidence in the United States if we didn't have some small glimmer of hope for change? Is it possible? Are we at least treating you better than they did then? Better than you've seen in the past? And he said, we have to destroy you now. Once your governments find out that we exist, same as ever, they will send armies for us. They'll destroy the whole planet. They'll build bombs with nuclear power. Your people are so close to discovering the atom 
now. And when you do, you'll use it. Mark my words, your governments will use the atomic genie to destroy whole cities. And if it's because of us, you won't stop till you find us. And we can't allow you to destroy our paradise again. We just can't let that happen. I took a moment and I realized we had one chance, a gamble. Maybe not a gamble, maybe maybe for once in my life I understood a little bit of truth. And I said, listen, listen to me now. There's so few of us that know of this error. We could all swear oaths of secrecy. The government could help these people out financially to make it worth their while to keep the, their silence. There'd be no reason for them to sell their story or tell anyone or make a deathbed confession. My government would leave you in peace knowing you're friendly, not foe. Knowing that someday you might be an ally to your fellow earthlings. That we aren't alone on this planet is a, is a striking thing. Maybe it could bring men and governments together someday. Someday. I have the authority to shut this whole thing down. Swear everyone to secrecy. It's a chance. It's my word and their word versus the death of the entire planet. Give us a chance to save it. There's men and women in this room, all represented. If we fail, if I go back to Washington, if I tell the President of the United States and Congress that there's marsupial humans on the planet, you'll know. Your technology will tell us out. I can't stop you. We didn't even know these four men were here. You have things beyond our comprehension. You're not even brandishing weapons, and we know we couldn't never challenge you. Not in this room. I know there's foolish men that would think they can, but I know we can't. So you've got to give me one chance. One chance in a million. That these people all understand that as well. Think of it this way. If we do go back until you can, you can take and carry out your plan then. Please. Give us one chance. The four men, the couple, the babies, all faded from our view. A new marsupial human stood in their place. They were gone. It was a female marsupial human, and she said to me and the others there, Raise your hand and swear an oath to me that you will not repeat anything that happens outside this room. Swear to me, Dr. Andrew Michaels, that you will help these people, that you will compensate them for their trouble, that you will make their lives mean something. Swear it now. We all raised our right hand before God in the world and did it. Before we knew it, that person was gone as well. That was 1932, General. We're still here. We're still alive. Everything they said or inferred has come to pass. We did crack the atom and build the bomb. Oh, and we did use it, not once but twice, 
and against our own people, our own human race. We haven't slowed down on destruction, but we have hope. I tell you this now. I break my oath, and I beg you, General, to not let that press story go out, to not let the Roswell Daily Record print that story about the UFO landing and crashing in the desert. They'll never stop looking for them. They'll search. They'll kill. They'll murder. They'll tear the whole government down. They'll burn this whole planet to a cinder to find them if they know they're here. You have to believe me. I have put the entire world in your hands. A lot of people would say that's foolish. But I'm a betting man. And I'm betting on you because you're like me. You want to do the right thing. Now I've told you my piece. The rest is up to you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? On July 8th, 1947, the Roswell Daily Record did publish the story of a flying saucer that crashed into a local field. Although a later press release indicated it had actually been a weather balloon, conspiracy theorists and truth seekers of all types are still debating what really happened in New Mexico all those years ago. Thank you for joining us for ASMR Tirar de Cuello. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. If you are interested in additional ASMR content, you may view our library of videos at youtube.com slash The theme song, Atlantis, is by Jason Shaw of audionautics.com and is used by permission. Correspondence, including questions or requests, may be sent to tirardehuello at gmail.com. On behalf of Dr. Andrew Michaels, thank you.